this is a, a great honor now to have uh, two very famous pa panelists for this uh, discussion about uh, the future of AI. So let me introduce uh, by alphabetical order, Professor Yann Lequin, who is a uh, vice president and chief AI scientist at Facebook, silver professor of computer science, data science, neural science, electrical and computer engineering at New York University. He is also a member of the US Academy, National Academy of Science, the US National Academy of Engineering, and he is a CM Turing Award laureate in 2018 for his uh, contribution to AI. So welcome, Jan. Thank you to be here with us today. And then Professor Raj Reddy, who is a university professor of computer science and robotics and uh, Moza Bin Nasser, sorry for the pronunciation, chair at the School of Computer Science at Car Carnegie Mellon University. He is uh, also the founder and first director of the Robotic Institute of uh, Carnegie Mellon, very famous one, and we will uh, speak about this department uh, in the next round table. Uh, he is also a member of the United States National Academy of Engineering and of the Indian National Academy of Science and he is ACM Turing Laureate for his contribution to uh, AI in 1994, uh, if I remember. So, welcome. Uh, I would like first to thank you, both of you, to be here today because it's not so easy to travel at this time. So, really thank you. And uh, I will let you the floor. So, we will start with a two short presentation before the discussion. All right, uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so uh, I think this is a panel about the future of AI. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the future challenges uh, on the way to making machines more intelligent and perhaps uh, towards human level AI. I don't use the word AGI because I don't think there is such a thing as general intelligence. So I don't, I don't like the term. Uh, but human level AI might be kind of a good concept or a good goal. Um, so the, the big question I think is, is how do we get machines to learn like animals and humans? The problem with machine learning at the moment and with AI in general, but machine learning in particular, is that um, uh, machines are very inefficient in terms of learning uh, with the type, the paradigms of learning that we use today, namely re uh, supervised learning and reinforcement learning. The number of uh, training samples or trials that are necessary to learn any kind of task is extremely large. Um, and it could be because you know, we, tra we train those machines from scratch, and so they don't have any background knowledge on which to, um, to kind of build uh, what they learn. Um, and you know, today, we cannot use either supervised or reinforcement learning to get cars to drive themselves safely. So how is it that a teenager can learn to drive a car in about 20 hours of practice without causing any crashes most of the time? Uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big mystery and there's a huge gap to, uh, f to, to fill. Now, babies learn how the world works, mostly by observation. In the first few months of life, they kind of figure out that there is things like uh, animate and inanimate objects, that there is gravity, and, you know, they learn about uh, intuitive physics and things like this. Um, and we're not able to reproduce this type of learning in machines, and this seems to be the main type of learning that animals and humans use. So that's the big challenge, I think, of the next few years. And the reason it's a big challenge is that if we think about a potential architecture for sort of an autonomously intelligent system, so a system in which the intelligence is not determined by, for a particular task, right? The, the machine is not trained to do a particular task, but it's trained in general, it trains itself, if you want, to uh, uh, solve particular tasks a little bit like, uh, uh, you know, living things. Um, and we think about the necessary architecture for, for this to happen. There has to be, of course, a perception module, and that we can do with supervised learning. There has to be a very important piece that we don't know how to build yet, which is kind of a, a model of the world. And, and what's more, a configurable model of the world that the system, or the animal in this case, could uh, configure to handle the situation at, at, uh, at hand. What this model of the world is supposed to do is predict in advance what the, the consequences of the agent's actions uh, will be, and that would allow the agent to, to plan. Um, the behavior of the agent would be driven by some sort of cost function, you know, an objective. We all have one of those uh, at the bottom of our brain in the basal ganglia, and it basically determines human nature and, you know, what kind of drives uh, our, our behavior. Um, so, 
if we believe in this architecture, the, the piece that we're missing today that we don't know how to build is, or with, with, with machines is this model of the world. How do we get machines to learn how the world works? Uh, and so that's where this concept of self-supervised learning comes in. Self-supervised learning is the idea of uh, having a, a signal, let's, for the sake of the example, let's say a video, and you show a segment of video to a machine and you ask the machine to predict what's going to happen next. If the machine has learned enough uh, abstract concepts about the world, it's going to be able to tell that they are you know, objects, that the world is three-dimensional, there are objects in the world, there are animate objects, perhaps uh, humans, and might be able to do a good job at abstracting the, 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 the concepts that will allow it to make some prediction about what's going to happen in the world. Um, and the second problem, so that's one, where one main major problem that we need to solve to get past the current limitations of AI systems. Uh, using self-supervised learning to get machines to represent the world and learn models of the world. The second one is uh, getting machines to learn to reason. With deep learning today, we, uh, we can get machines to learn perception, basically things that are sort of reactive, if you want. But how do we get machines to reason? And uh, what's more, how do we get machines to reason in such a way that is compatible with gradient-based learning or deep learning? Because we know how to get machines to reason using logic, but that's essentially incompatible with machine learning because it's very discrete, right? You manipulate symbols with logic. Um, so we don't know how to do this. Um, um, here's a, a small um, uh, animation and a video at the bottom if it can be started. I'm not sure it can be started. Yes, it can. Uh, if you get a machine, if you train a, a neural net to predict what's going to happen in a video, what you get are blurry predictions, which you can see at the, at the top, or you can also see on the second column at the, the video at the bottom. Uh, this is a, a, a top-down view of uh, a highway and cars are moving and there is a predictive system that tries to predict where the cars are going to go. Mm -hmm. And if you ask the system to make a single prediction, it's going to make blurry prediction because it doesn't know among all the possible scenarios which one will occur and so it predicts the average of all the possible future scenarios and that's kind of a blurry image. So the question is how do we, the, the main technical question we have to solve now if we want machines to build models of the world or to learn models of the world is how to represent uncertainty. And uh, the, the problem with this is that we know how to do this represent uncertainty for discrete uh, objects like text. Uh, uh, Kyung Yun Cho this morning talked about the large language models. So this is an example where we can represent uncertainty uh, because the tokens that are being generated are discrete. So we can represent a distribution over discrete tokens. But in things like video, we don't know how to represent good distributions over video frames. Um, so my solution to this is something called energy-based models, which I'm not going to talk about. But then the next question is, uh, what, um, what are architectures for multimodal prediction? And my clicker doesn't work anymore. Can you switch to the next slide? Ah, here we go. Um, so there are really two kinds of architectures. One is uh, architectures that I would call latent variable models or regularized latent variable models, which I'm not going to talk much about. And the second one is uh, called joint embedding architectures. And those architectures have become uh, kind of the hottest topic in uh, self-supervised learning applied to computer vision these days. Um, so they, um, and sorry for the formatting mistakes, but the, uh, the, the basic idea of this is that you show an X and a Y, for example, the segment of a video and a continuation of that segment of video, and you train a machine to produce representations in such a way that the representation of the following segment is predictable from the previous segment. Uh, in practice, people train this using uh, pairs of images rather than video, but, uh, um, and there is all, all kinds of different ways to train those uh, contrasting methods and what's, I think, more exciting non-contrasting methods. So this is, in my opinion, kind of the, the most interesting thing that has been happening in, uh, in AI over, or machine learning over the last, uh, I'd say, 10 years. So I'm, I'm sort of going uh, back a, uh, quite a long time. Uh, I think this may be the ticket for uh, getting machines to learn hierarchical representations of the world and, and learn perhaps predictive models of the world uh, in, in some way. So th those models are very primitive at, at the moment and I'm not going to go into the details, details of how they work um, uh, at all and, and just conclude. Um, so I think self-supervised learning really is the, the future of, uh, of AI uh, to learn representations and learn predictive models. Uh, the big technical difficulty is how to handle uncertainty in the prediction because the world is not entirely predictable and can be intrinsically stochastic. Um, uh, you know, this will may allow uh, uh, machines to learn uh, world models from observation, a little bit like animals and human babies, perhaps. Uh, and the last question is, uh, you know, how, how do we get machines to do reasoning in that context? Uh, perhaps it's... Uh, 
we can sort of reduce this to some form of uh, energy minimization or inference uh, as is done in, in graphical models. Uh, but in any case, we'll have to uh, avoid symbols and logic and use things like vectors and continuous functions. And I'm sort of parroting uh, Jeff Hinton there. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. So ne now we will uh, have a talk of Professor Raj Reddy if, uh, if it fits. Okay. If the slide Thank you. This was the topic that was given to us, future of AI, right? <coughs> it's an interesting to topic. Predicting future is, is always a risky business, but there are several ways of ap approaching it. One is to look to the past for inspiration. I was fortunate to start in AI in 1963 and had the opportunity to work with all the four founders of AI. My advisor was John McCarthy, Marvin Minsky was visiting Stanford, and I was working with him in 1964. And then when I went to Carnegie Mellon, I had the opportunity uh, to work with Newell and Simon. So, close it. <laughs> so, um, one of the things I remember from talking to them and spending time with them is the how central human-centric AI was for them. The main idea was we are doing AI to enhance the capabilities of the human beings. It's an intelligence amplifier. Just like engineering amplifies your physical capabilities, AI should attempt to amplify your mental capabilities. And by induction, it would improve your productivity, human productivity, just like when you're driving, you're going 10 times faster than walking, perhaps, or 20 times. What was missing, that's also interesting to look at, uh, at that time, was any, any discussion about intuition or creativity or innovation or emotion or empathy in AI. Now we talk about it, you know, and it's not unreasonable to talk about it. I think the main reason we didn't think about it or talk about it seriously is because we didn't know how to define success or failure. When, I, when we were working on vision or speech or walking or chess or any of those problems we worked with, we may not know how to do it, but we knew how to measure criteria of success or failure. Did we succeed or not? That was not true with these other abstract concepts. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't work on it. We cannot work on it. We will, I'm sure. But at that time, it was not there. The second interesting discussion that happens is general AI versus special AI. To me, it's a continuum. It's not, and uh, the, I take the definition of intelligence from uh, what Alan Newell's list uh, that is a, an intelligent system would have at least the following attributes. Learn from experience, acquire and use large amounts of knowledge, operate in real time, tolerate error and ambiguity, collaborate and communicate using language. A, a physical or virtual environment than there is in, in text. Uh, it's a higher bandwidth uh, uh, environment, if you want. And so I think we're not going to have uh, machines with common sense until we have machines that can learn uh, the, the, the working of, of an environment, whether it's uh, the, the, the real world or whether it's a virtual environment. Uh, this, and, and we don't have this at the moment. As I said in my talk, we, we're lacking the, the, the basic techniques, uh, learning techniques, learning paradigms for this, uh, for this to happen at the moment. But I think when it happens, we may have a chance at building machines that acquire some level of common sense. The most intelligent machines at the moment that we have have less common sense than a, than a house cat. I think common sense is, um, again, a hierarchical thing. Nam namely, right now we have natural language systems 
uh, you know, that are able to predict the next word, right? The, you know, the birth and other kinds of things. So the reason, uh, now you can, you can say, does that have common sense? Uh, it does in the following sense, namely, if I said bank, is it a river bank or, or a money bank? By, uh, by looking at the adjacent context, you can most of the time predict what it is. So it's actually understanding, disambiguating the word bank by, by context. However, there is a sequence of sentences, if you haven't heard about them, you can do, do a Google search called Winograd Schema. There, they d he demonstrates by just changing one word in a complex sentence, the complete meaning is changed. That is not predictable by the type of, you know, uh, transformer, BERT, uh, and subsequent systems that have been built because they don't have a knowledge of the semantic understanding of the world. Only when you understand the world, how the world operates, you are able to disambiguate that sentence and, and, and interpret what the meaning is. And so there are different hierarchies. And I think we'll get there. It's just a question of time. You know, I'm, I'm an optimist. Well, the, I mean, the Winograd schema is interesting because it, it indicates the dynamics between the, you know, sort of different uh, school of thought in, a, in AI. So, you know, several years ago, of course, you know, people in uh, what is now called classical AI or good old fashioned AI said, okay, machines don't have common sense because they can't solve those Winograd schemas. And uh, Winograd schema is, uh, you know, to, to tell, I mean, it's t a sentence of the type, um, something like the, the, um, uh, the trophy doesn't fit in a suitcase because it's too large, or the trophy doesn't fit in a suitcase because it's too small. In the first case, the it refers to the, to the trophy. In the second one, it refers to the, to the, to the suitcase. And to disambiguate what the pronoun refers to, you have to understand that you know you put a trophy in a suitcase, and you know the container has to be larger than the than the object. So that calls uh, common sense. Uh, so there was um, uh, one of our colleagues at NYU, actually uh, Ernie Davis, collected a bunch of those sentences, and uh, and then uh, and then someone in the NLP community started collecting a, a data set of such sentences or or generating them. I'm not sure. Uh, and so people working on NLP started kind of trying to sold those Winograd schemas, and only a few years ago, the performance was 60% correct, and chance is at 50%, right? So it was really terrible. Um, and, and so, you know, people said, machines don't have common sense. And then those, uh, you know, large language model transformers, BERT, whatever, appeared even before that, and the performance started to go up. It went up to 75, 80, 90%. Human performance is at 95, something like that, right? Um, and now it's pretty close to human performance. I don't know what the latest numbers are. I'm, I'm sure Kyung-Yung knows, right. but, uh, but it's actually pretty close to human performance. And so now the sort of uh, classical AI people are saying, oh, but that's a bad test, you know? Uh, we, we, we thought, you know, five years ago this was a good test, but that's not a good, you know, it's actually not such a good test. Uh, there is a similar uh, thing with the Turing test because uh, the Turing test in the past was, was viewed as uh, you know, a, a good test for whether a machine is intelligent. It turns out with a few tricks, you can basically fool, uh, you know, relatively naive people that uh, what you are uh, talking to is a human and not a machine. And so that became not such a good test anymore. And, you know, nobody right. serious really kind of <coughs> uses the Turing test as, uh, so as serious. Even if you cannot solve the Winograd problems, that's only a small percent of the problems you come across in the world with that, with that kind of common sense. Uh, there's been a very good landmark uh, achievement. There's a, a place called Allen Institute for AI. And uh, in 2015, they took on this challenge of answering questions at the end of the chapter or taking an exam, eighth, you know, eighth grade exam. They started with AP and failed miserably. They finally came to eighth grade science exams. And uh, it turned out when they took the test, because it, we didn't have the transformer BERT-like models, the, it, the accuracy was only 50%. They got a D, <laughs> failing grade. Five years later, in, in, in now four years later, they got an A, 90%. Why? Yeah, in, in the they took the same test. They're a different test. Every year there's a different test. And, um, and they got an A because they are able to disambiguate many of the words and do, do the right thing, interpret the question properly, 
and provide the answer. So my feeling is, that in this hierarchy of common sense, with, with the kind of models that are already being built with GPT-3 and uh, subsequent ones that will come out, we will be pretty close to high-quality high common sense in the, in, the, in the predicting. That doesn't mean we'll be able to solve all the problems. There will still be tricky things that somebody can come up with, like the Vinograd schema, that will take long, longer. But we'll solve them. That's the, that's the beauty of it. Yeah, I guess there's a question, you know, will, will machines ever reach uh, human-level intelligence? This is a question that I'm being asked by, you know, in sort of situations where there's sort of general audience and things like that. Will machines ever be as intelligent as humans in every domain where humans are intelligent? And the answer, in my opinion, is uh, unqualified yes. That will happen. Uh, we just don't know when. It may take a long time. It will take a long time, but it will happen. There's no question. Long time doesn't mean much. Thousand years in the creation of intelligence, it's still a minuscule time. You know, it took a, a human beings 70,000 years after the development of the frontal cortex. So we, um, thank you for that very optimistic view. <laughs> Uh, there or, are a lot or of pessimistic, depending. <laughs> or pessimistic, yes. Uh, there are a lot of phantasms about AI, uh, uh, mimicking a human and so on. So what about uh, other things like emotion? Or uh, do you think uh, an AI can uh, can have emotion or at least show emotion? Can can an AI have creativity or all the other characteristics of humans? There is a very interesting book by Marvin Minsky. You know, in, the, in his later years, he wrote a book. You know, he was thinking about emotion, called Emotion Machines. And he comes up with an architecture. And it has not been possible to validate it one way or the other, mainly because it fails the improving the human productivity test. You know, you can talk about general AI and all kinds of AI. You'll keep talking for the next hundred years. Nobody will do them. It has to have a, a profit motive, a business model, something that will help the human race. And the things that will help the human race will be tools that will improve their productivity, enhance their mental capability. And these are the ones that will be developing because there is money there. All the other ones we'll talk, keep talking about for a long time. And I believe there are a lot of those things uh, which will happen, but, uh, but not in the emotion machine. Creativity and in, you know, intuition will happen before emotion, I think. But emotion are important in that we, most of us have mental problems. Many of us <laughs> have mental problems. And insofar as you have an intelligent assistant that can help you to detect your problem, and then create an appropriate environment where you can survive it. I think we'd have a, you know, so the, the medical AI people that are working on it, they would, should be the ones that are working on it. So I have, I have a rather unorthodox uh, opinion about emotions. So I showed an architecture for an autonomous intelligence system um, and uh, in, in, the, in, in my slides. And this, uh, this architecture, uh, the 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 behavior or the function of this uh, of this of this type of, of system is determined by essentially an objective, um, uh, an objective that sort of drives the machine or the system, the agent, whatever you want to call it, to uh, basically satisfy it. Right. So the 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 it's you, you can sort of symbolize it by some sort of cost function that the machine tries to minimize. Okay. It tries to minimize uh, its its sort of in, its its incomfort, right? So the the cost function measures how unco uncomfortable the machine is, um, and the machine tries to take action so that it, it gets into a state or gets the world into a state that makes it comfortable. Um, now, to be able to do this, it has to be able to anticipate what the consequences of an action is going to be, not just by predicting the state of the world through the world model, but also predict the whether the consequence of, of that, it is going to be positive or negative for itself. 
Um, and in, you know, I went too fast through, through this slide, but in the slide I was represented as a, as a critic. So critic is a, a kind of a standard module in reinforcement learning systems where that basically predicts the, the value or the reinforcement or the objective in the future. Um, the expectation, the expe expected value of the, of the, of the cost. Uh, this kind of prediction is a primitive form of emotion in the sense that uh, fear, for example, is a, an anticipation of a negative outcome or is an anticipation of an unknown outcome which could be negative. Okay. Uh, elation is the other way around. It's an anticipation of a positive outcome. And so a lot of emotions are basically anticipations of outcomes. So if you have an autonomous intelligence system that has some predictive engine uh, that can predict the state of the world in the future and predict its own state of happiness or unhappiness, uh, it will have emotion. So I think emotions are an inherent part of autonomous intelligence. We will not be able to build autonomous intelligent machines without them having emotions. It's an integral part of it. That's my unorthodox position. Raj, do you want to no. Yeah, it's survival. And if I believe emotion came before intelligence, actually. And the human, in the evolution of, uh, of animals, and all of us are emotional beings. And if you can't survive, you're not going to have any intelligence in it either. So it's for sure. I mean, you, you could try to make the difference between uh, autonomous intelligence and non-autonomous intelligence. And the, the difference I make between the two is the fact that Non-autonomous intelligence is, uh, you know, a, a system that whose whose behavior is not necessarily predetermined. It can be learned, but it's not determined by, you know, optimizing some objective. It's determined by, you know, basically a task it has to accomplish. Um, so you can have, uh, you know, living systems that do not have, you know, living organisms that that do not have emotions because, you know. They're very primitive nervous systems, or perhaps none at all, and their reactions is kind of very, very simple. It's not determined by, you know, optimizing some objective. It's just, you know, do this when this happens, kind of like, you know, reflexes and things like this. But then uh, at some level of complexity, you have this sort of autonomous uh, intelligence emerging where, you know, for humans, for example, nature tells us when we're hungry, but doesn't tell us how to feed ourselves. Okay, so that's an example of uh, 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 sort of an architecture that requires autonomous intelligence. We, we, we know we have to feed, we just don't know how, and we have to figure it out. Okay, this is very different from, uh, y you know, I, I, I bang on your knee and your, your, knee, you know, your leg goes up. That's, that's a reflex, right? There, there's no um, uh, objective function that kind of decides on this. It's kind of hardwired. So those are, those are the difference between autonomous and non-autonomous intelligence. Autonomous intelligence needs to have emotions. You can't work with that. Thank you. Uh, if we come back to a very, uh, uh, very concrete question uh, in the midterm, so do you think there, is, there are still in a human life domain that will not be affected by uh, artificial intelligence? Because we, sp we have uh, spoken about creativity, about uh, well, it's like asking: uh, Are there aspects of human life that are not affected by electrical power? <laughs> um, I mean, sure, you can live in the woods <laughs> without electrical power, but uh, but the the path of least resistance for most people is to actually have somehow access to. Electrical power. So I think it's going to be the same for, for, for AI. It's going to multiply your intelligence, as Raj uh, said, and uh, people will find they probably have a hard time not using it in situations. It's going to make everyone more uh, productive and you know, powerful in some way. Uh, and I imagine few people will sort of avoid it. I think in the, in, the, in the at least near term future, we will find just like, you know, industrial revolution and subsequent things, you know, invention of electricity and uh, automobiles and everything, planes, kind of enhanced our physical capabilities and, you know, we could do things. I think we'll have, you know, capabilities that we don't now have. 
That's where these guardian angel technologies come in. They can actually, they can find out things that are happening around the world that we don't have enough capability to find out and then synthesize the implications of it and tell us something bad is going to happen or something else, there's a traffic jam there, take this other route or whatever. And all of those things will significantly enhance our abilities to do things that we now cannot do. That doesn't mean they're going to replace us or anything, they're just giving us additional capability. And uh, we never complained when the computers were initially invented to multiply numbers in, in, in the 40s and 50s. And that's all they could do for nuclear codes. And uh, uh, during that time, already we could actually multiply, you know, a million times better than human beings can. And so this is a continuum of capabilities that the system, AI systems will create for human beings so that we can be a lot more effective and productive. Now, of course, people will say, if you're more productive, they will lose the jobs. That is not going to be the case. I think we'll always find <laughs> things to do and there will be wealth to create because compared to 100 years ago, we are much better off. The whole world is much better off. In 100 years, that will be again the case. Today, there are a lot of people that are still go hungry, that are still illiterate, they're, you know, they're, so there's a big debate in USA about providing free education all the way to the thing, because right now the systems are such that it, it costs a lot of money. But if we improve the productivity and if everybody can learn without a teacher, and we can give the, everybody college level education without there even, you know, there, there's a whole model called KG to PG without leaving your village. Because we now have the technology to provide all the education and tools without, you know. And so there, there'll be a lot of things that'll happen that are going to be truly, you know, transformative for the society. And uh, that won't lose to lead to loss of jobs. We'll get a lot, we can use a lot more teachers. You know, the, learning without a teacher. So us AI researchers are going to put ourselves, university professors, out of a job, right? I no, no, university professors will not be out it's of a job. <coughs> None of the people exist in a current one, because it turns out people get stuck when they're learning. <coughs> they need to ask somebody. They, they, it will become, uh, as Justine was saying, one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Right now, we don't do that because it cannot be done. There's not enough people. If you can provide one-on-one -on -one tutoring and on demand when the student is stuck, then that will, in fact, mean they will learn much faster. They'll learn what they're motivated to learn, not because somebody else laid out a curriculum. And it's, a, it's an exciting future world in which people learn what they want to learn, not what they're told to learn. Thank you. We are going on a little bit at the end of, of the session. So maybe to, as a conclusion, do you have a few words, maybe your, your best prediction or your hope or your fear, maybe? Uh, my prediction it basically is follows Alan Kay. You know, Alan Kay said in, I think, 1971, he was supposed to be paraphrasing Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And Alan Kay said, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. I, I think we in AI know all the things that can be done and will be done. We should invent them because it's good for humans, uh, humankind. It'll help people to get and do more things with less effort. And that's where I think the opportunities are. Yeah, since, uh, you know, our forebears um, in AI have systematically been wrong about predictions on the progress of AI. I think I'll stick to the inventing thing and not go into the <laughs> predicting thing. <laughs> right. um, uh, but y yeah, uh, I mean, I have a rather, you know, I'm not sure if it's optimistic because uh, every technological progress is kind of a double-edged sword and it can be used for good things and bad things. The best way to protect ourselves against 
bad uses of technology generally and AI in particular is the, tr the strength of our democratic institutions. So, um, you know, let's defend democracy. Thank you very much. So thank you, both of you.